that we're we're ready to go. Um, and I'll just ask you some questions and we'll walk through some things. So yeah, we're re we are recording now. Um, first, ex explain just the basic question to me. Uh, most people may not even realize that schools today are segregated in a lot of cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Syracuse, not too much different in that respect. What does that mean to say schools are segregated today? That means that the um, population, the student population of the school is disproportionate um, to the population of the community in terms of um, minorities or uh, also in terms of um, socioeconomic, socioeconomic factors, which are kind of today the factors that one needs if there's going to be effective desegregation. So it really is, it's a two tiered issue, isn't it? It's not just black and white necessarily, especially with the complexion of today's segregation. There's multiple, there's, right. there may be Spanish speaking communities, Asian communities, right. but you also had the poverty layered in and that that's an important element. Yes, uh, mostly because uh, that's your way of surviving a challenge in federal court because the uh, Supreme Court has not yet said that uh, billionaires are a protected class, although one never knows with this court. Right, right. What does it matter whether schools are segregated or not? Well, what matters is uh, that if schools are segregated, uh, generally you get the least experienced teachers, you get the lowest level of investment, um, you get uh, resources that are insufficient, and I think more importantly, um, you cut off at a very early age, you cut uh, students off from opportunities to succeed in life. And why does that matter to not only that student whose opportunity has been cut off, but why does that matter to the greater community in which we live and, and for that matter, the state, the country? Because if they're educated, they'll have an awful lot to contribute. And uh, this country was, although it was, of course, it was built on slavery. Um, now, uh, there, I mean, look at, uh, I mean, look at the current administration of the federal government, the pre from the vice president to all the people that are in the cabinet. With these, if people are educated, if they are, um, if these opportunities are made available uh, to them early in life. So in fact, they can connect with the people that have the power. Um, it pays off in later life and that's later life. And that is established uh, through some extensive scholarship. I'm not sure if you're aware of uh, the work of Rucker Johnson, Children of the Dream. Mm -hmm. and, and there's another fellow too. I don't know if you followed Tom Pettigrew from years ago. Um, yeah. I don't know him. He did I some know. work with Harvard, who he's now in California. He's well yeah. into his 80s, but I think it's along a similar line of what you're, but, you're, but go ahead, explain what. Yeah, well, Rucker, uh, this is an irony of sorts. Um, you know, we filed the first case in, Minis in Minneapolis uh, in 1995. At that time, the, the uh, superintendent of schools was an African-American woman named Carol Johnson. Her son is Rucker Johnson, who is now a professor at uh, Berkeley, who has done a longitudinal study covering decades and thousands of um, African-American children uh, who went from desegregated or went from segregated to desegregated schools and tracked their, their outcomes of life, in life, which that's the real measure of the success of education. They went farther in school, they did better in school, they had less involvement in the criminal justice system, they earned more money, um, they were, had more job satisfaction, and finally they had better health outcomes. And to me, that says everything you need to know, better health out outcomes. Doesn't mean because you have better health out a better health outcome, your life is, um, all good, but it's hard to, for your life to be good if you don't. 
Exactly, which actually we've seen within the, the, the pandemic itself, the, the right. multiplying factor within uh, impoverished and, and certain racial minorities being hit harder right. uh, by this. Uh, you, you know, you, you mentioned the federal court system and the, you know, everybody I think knows something about the Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas, you know, 1954. Yeah, Brown case. Didn't, that, didn't that solve everything? No, it didn't because um, basically it's almost a dead letter today. The, um, and it began with the Milliken case um, in the eight, late 80s where the Supreme Courts, where Detroit, a lot of these school districts are defined by city limits. Yeah. If you've got a city that's 80 to 90% African-American um, or you know, some combination of poor and minority that gets you to 70 or 80 percent of the kids going to school. You can't desegregate this. You can't desegregate that district. You need to involve the suburbs um, and schools that are uh, that are not segregated. And the court in Milliken, the Supreme Court said, well, you know, the schools are segregated by fat factors that nobody intended, which of course is historically wrong. Um, but uh, so you can't get this, you can't order participation by the suburbs um, unless you show that they have intentionally caused or contributed to uh, the segregation in the inner city or in their own schools. Um, and so that, the, the key word there is intentionally proving intent, um, which is always difficult. Uh, you know, in Brown, they had direct evidence of intent. Um, people passed laws, but right. without that, uh, it, that, that in effect has emasculated Brown. Well, uh, in the Milliken case, uh, which I mentioned the email that I've, I have followed that and I've, and I've listened to the oral arguments and, and, uh, and the chief justice giving the decision and Thurgood Marshall giving his dissent to it. And, and you, it seemed to me that the word remedy um, was, was more of a punishment. Like they, they, they were saying, we don't wanna punish the suburban districts yeah. by having this burden of having to integrate uh, on, a more full, uh, on a full basis or at all for that matter. Um, yeah. When really remedy shouldn't be a punishment, it's a remedy for an existing problem that needs somebody to oversee it and say, we need to do this, isn't that? And, it, and, it's, and it, it's not punishment because it benefits everyone. Right. I mean, you know, it, in a desegregation and integration are bene, benefit the white majority, um, maybe not equally, but certainly to a great extent. And in, in that case, there, there's a couple of factors. One, uh, they're, they're trying to say that the state was responsible, not the, not the local school districts, that there's a bigger government element, which is relevant yes. to your case too, right? right? In Minnesota, you're making a similar claim that it's the state, the bigger government right. that's created this problem. Explain what you're seeing in, in your, your area too, and that's relevant to really what happened in Detroit. Well, there's a history. Um, well, actually, we are not in federal court, and that's very intentional. Right. We are going under the state constitution, which says that the that has an education clause, as most state constitutions do, and it says that the uh, legislature shall create a general and uniform system of public schools and shall by taxation or otherwise provide funding so that the schools are thorough and efficient, general uniform, thorough and efficient. Our claim originally was um, these schools are segregated because they're segregated. Uh, they are separate because they're separate. They're not equal because they're not equal. Children don't get an adequate education. Um, and at the time we did this, uh, when we filed this case, uh, the present case in 2015, I think, mm -hmm. um, or maybe 2016, the um, Minnesota Supreme Court had decided a prior case, Skeen, S-K-E-E-N versus mm -hmm. State of Minnesota, where they said that the education clause 
puts a mandatory uh, duty on the legislature to provide an adequate education, which is the first time they had said that. Um, we said that a segregated education can't be adequate. That was the theory of our case. Um, when we, we ended up, first of all, the state tried to throw the case out in the uh, district court, the trial court, they failed. They were permitted to take an appeal claiming that the case was not, there was no jurisdiction for the case, which means the court wasn't empowered to hear it. And the Intermediate Court of Appeals agreed with them. I immediately asked the Minnesota Supreme Court to review the case, which they agreed to do. And I, they decided in my favor um, in um, 2018, I think it was July 25th, 2018. And one of the things they said, and this is, I, I don't think any court, any state Supreme Court had said this before. And this is in footnote six, where, and I'm quoting it. And this is, this was our magic bullet, our silver bullet. It is self-evident that a segregated system of public schools is not general, uniform, thorough, or efficient. Self-evident. Now, that is, I mean, that is, you know, the state has nowhere to go after that. Um, also, I think, and we haven't had a decision on this yet, that that takes the issue of intent out of the case, whether the state intended to segregate or not. Um, because under e the Equal Protection Clause in our state constitution, which we also sued under, and under the Federal Education Clause, it's uh, uh, Equal Protection Clause, it says no, the state can't deny anyone the equal protection of the laws, which means under that clause, the in order to have a claim, the state or the, the jurisdiction has, the government has to do something to deprive you of something. Under the education clause, the state doesn't have to, the state is required to give you something. And, Not, and, and intent is taken out of it. Yes, because, you know, it's not that they, it, it's not about taking something away. It's about a duty to provide it. So if they don't provide it, it, do, it doesn't matter what their reason is because they have a mandate to provide it. So I'm you, hoping. Do you feel like that, that this avenue of going uh, under the state constitution is the most effective way, not only in Minneapolis and in, in St. Paul and in, within Minnesota, but also for most states in, in the country as opposed to federal at this point? Absolutely, because then if you'll see, that's where all the litigation is. You don't find school desegregation cases in federal court anymore. Um, that, I mean, it's all over the country. For example, 27 states have addressed state Supreme Courts have now addressed, and there may be more since um, the decision in our case, have addressed the question of whether, um, I think it's 28 now, whether the issue is, whether courts can hear and decide this issue, whether the term in law is justiciable. Mm -hmm. um, the, the scorecard is 23 to five in favor. And the five that say no, they have state, they have education clauses that are much different from um, the clauses, the clause that Minnesota has and that most states have. They're much weaker. They're kind of aspirational. The legislature shall try to do this. Um, so the answer is absolutely. That's where the action is now. Um, now, in fact, one of the things that happened in our, you, the issue of how we got to where we are and whether the state has a role in it. We had three charter schools that intervened in our case um, because basically they have, they're segregated or at least two of them are and they are afraid of what we're gonna do to them uh, if we win the case. Um, they have, under Minnesota law, they are exempted from, uh, a de any desegregation rule or the current desegregation rule. Hmm. So they filed a motion 
to um, have the court declare that that was constitutional. They conceded that if we showed that the state had intentionally um, created segregation, that, that their exemption was not constitutional. I submitted evidence and we you know, I, this is the second one of these cases. Right, I yeah, I know you went at it once filed before. Filed the first one in 1995. Yeah. Now, in the late 80s, the um, and early 90s, the um, Minnesota legislature saw the problem with desegregation in the metropolitan area in the in within the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. The population had become so like 70% kids of color, over 70% free or reduced lunch. Mm -hmm. So they created a um, integration roundtable and asked them to come up with a new desegregation rule. They had a rule that said that the, um, the composition of a school could not be more out of line with the demographics by, of the community by more than 15%. Um, and then it would have to desegregate because of the large proportion of minority and poor students, that was impossible. So they said, we need a new rule. And they came up and this round table came up with a new rule that a proposed rule that uh, required mandatory participation by the suburbs to eliminate racial imbalance um, define segregation as the fact of disproportionate representation. Um, so there was no requirement of intent and said nothing about all schools were subject to it, including charter schools. Did it go through? The legislature approved it, but then the, as they were going, they had to go through a rulemaking. The, gover the governor at the time was a Republican. He had the attorney general second a conservative lawyer to the Department of Education who rewrote the rule so that the suburbs could not be shown to, could not participate unless they had be, were intentionally uh, segregating. Um, segregation was defined as intentional. Um, so similar to the Milliken decision then essentially. Yeah, it was uh, even worse. And then the charter schools were exempted. Hmm. Charter schools began in Minnesota. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. And with the purpose of being uh, one race, mean like white only? Uh, not necessarily, but that's the way a lot of it has ended up. Hmm. You know, not just white only, but also minority only, because um, when you have failing, segregated, failing public schools, that's an easy way to market and draw students mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to segregated uh, charter schools, which you know promise to educate these, give these kids a better education, although they really don't. Um, and we have documents. We have the documents for all of this. This historical change, which resulted in the new rule and which was enacted in 1998. And in the course of this, they said, this is going to result in greater segregation. Hmm. So they knew what they were doing. And also Minneapolis came in, came to the state in the late nineties and asked for a waiver of the existing desegregation rule before the new rule went into effect. And the state granted the waiver, even though the document showed this is, you know, they said, we're going to go to neighborhood schools because they had been desegregated. But they said, we're now going to go to neighborhood schools. Um, we know this will uh, result in more racial isolation, but we can get more parent involvement, which was, to use a legal term, bullshit. Um, and... <laughs> And it and it just got is worse. That, wait, is that Latin? Is that <laughs> yeah, right? Bullshit. <laughs> well, you know, so, you bring up a you bring up a point though that's relevant, and and I as much as I'm telling your story, I'm I'm also trying to bring it back to what's what's relevant in our own community, which is is a, a mirror image in many ways. Yes. Um, the idea of neighborhood schools. Yeah. You know, and 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 
and even in the federal cases that came uh, in, in as the bench got more and more conservative on the on the at the Supreme Court, you'd hear Scalia, for example, saying, "Well, they're neighborhood schools. We can't do anything about the demographics that have happened within the neighborhood." Um, but but you know, and those who look at it closely know that it was government practices right. that led to this segregation. It doesn't seem to me that there's been uh, a, a case made about that part of it, and and I don't, I'm not nearly as familiar with the law as you by any stretch. So so maybe there has been, but has has well, there been working on it? I mean, you know, they they got disparate impact, yeah, um, to be approved. Five, I guess it was five four um, in the Supreme Court, and that's important. Um, you know, let me just, uh, anyway, the, yeah. the end I'm tying up here, Sure. You know, we show, we presented all this evidence to the court and the, the judge said, there is enough evidence here to show that this, that this segregation was intentionally caused by the state. I'm not going to decide that now, but I can't grant the charter school's motion to say that there is no evidence of intent. So... So he's that, saying that there, there is intent. Sure. Yeah. There's certainly knowledge. I mean, that's undisputed. When, now that you're into this second case and this second go around and you felt that it was needed, necessary to bring it back. And, I, and, and from what it sounded like, from what I've heard you speak about this, you had an issue in search of some clients that right. were, were being discriminated against um, along with others and, and now a class. How is it going at this point? Um, you've had some change in politics and, yes. and you continue to push the case forward. So explain to me, where are you now and how, what are you okay. trying to get to? Okay, when we, in um, the fall of 2018, um, we had an election. Up to that point, the, the state attorney general's office, which was defending the case, had fought me on everything everything you know it was like uh you know we were fighting inch by inch i could see that in the supreme court case that where you i watched yeah, the video well that, you saw yes yeah, she, she would not Olsen. answer she would not concede that it was the sky was blue yeah right well and that of course that hurt him big time um in the fall of 2018 keith ellison was elected at minnesota attorney general the first African-American, the first Muslim attorney general in the history of the state of Minnesota. Shortly, short, so where that takes us to, uh, yeah, that takes us to early 2019 when he, Keith gets sworn in. I had known him before. We had supported him, mm -hmm. um, you know, had a fundraiser for him and all that. And mm -hmm. he's, he's a wonderful guy. He reached out and said, are you willing to mediate this case? This was um, in, and I said, yes, with certain conditions that he agreed to. And we began to mediate, including our selecting one of the mediators. Um, and we began meeting, we had our first meeting, mediation meeting, in March of uh, 2019, and we we have we got the court to stay proceedings while we mediated. We have been in mediation continuously since that time, trying to working towards a comprehensive desegregation education reform solution for uh, for Minnesota. And we, uh, we will be filing a status report with the judge tomorrow, hmm. which I can send to you, a joint sure. status report, um, which says that um, we have made substantial progress and um, we expect, we anticipate the introduction of legislation um, to arrive at a settlement of the case. And is that a key that, that that you're going to need legislation to enact the goals of, of the mediation? Yes, especially as, you know, it's got to, it had got to involve um, budgeting, um, you know, for what's going to happen. Um, we don't, it's a, it's a lot quicker than what would be a rulemaking. 
uh, an administrative rulemaking. Um, so, uh, but th th in this mediation, we have heard from uh, experts from all over the country. Rucker Johnson came. Um, the, there is a fellow in San Antonio, Texas, who is worth talking to, Mohammed Chowdhury, who has implemented a desegregation um, plan through um, magnet schools uh, and, and based on socioeconomic status that the state of that the state legislature has approved of and they've used his method of basically sorts uh, neighborhoods by census tract and assigns them one of five tiers depending on the socioeconomic depending on the how the analysis turns out it's based on um, median income of a census block um, number of single fam single family um, single parent families, uh, education level, and also um, income. Did I, yeah. it's home ownership, parents' education level, single family parents and income, those four factors. And when, when you say magnet school, where would the magnet schools be in the city and in suburbs, and then there'd be yeah. two-way traffic between them for all populations? That's the idea. Mandatory? No, mandatory for the um, mandatory for the school districts, but not for the parents. And what's the difference there? The difference is parents can't complain that they're having to bus their kids and, you know, have their kids travel miles or go into hostile environments. Of course, that's one of the things that that really needs work. Um, keep more teachers of color, um, retention of teachers of color, in other words, license, easing licensing requirements, um, racial sensitivity training, training in implicit bias, um, elimination of tracking, which will basically um, eliminate what's called secondary or second level segregation where kids are you know sent minority kids are sent to schools where they're segregated in those schools mm -hmm. we can't have that um and tracking of course is a big means of doing that um classes there, have to be would you also then would you still have the same school districts remain in place you wouldn't have to necessarily redefine what a a suburban Eden Prairie district is versus downtown St. Paul. No. Or, yeah, yeah. The districts are the districts would remain in place. There's nothing, you know. There's nothing preordained about a district um, being contiguous with uh, city boundaries. In fact, we have districts that encompass uh, numerous now communities. Mm -hmm. And I also. There is there are smaller districts with a taken from other districts. So, um, but we're not talking about redefinition of districts. Um, Do you think there's going to be resistance, uh, or let me put it a different way: How much resistance will there be once it gets into the legislature? Is it something that's going to get through it? Well, that's what we're working on. <laughs> you know, we have we have a divided legislature. The House is Democratic. The Senate is now Republican. We have a, uh, a, a Democratic governor, of course, Tim Walls, mm -hmm. uh, terrific governor. Um, so we are we're hopeful, and I can't really go into the details. Sure, um, but we are hopeful. I mean, we're going to try to get buy-in. That's a big um, that's a big uh, issue. We we want a uh, you know our objectives are integration achievement, opportunity, equity, public buy-in, and permanence. It, it, it's a long view play, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and we have, I mean, in this mediation, we have consulted with essentially all the stakeholders, teachers unions, um, school superintendents, um, charter schools, 
Um, and the, the, the vast majority of charter schools, I would say, are receptive to integration. Hmm. Although, you know, in this community, we unfortunately have uh, too many that are segregated white or segregated uh, children of color or socioeconomically. Sure. Do you, uh, for other communities in other states, how does, how does this kind of action take place? You obviously were willing as a leading attorney to do this on a pro bono basis with obviously personal investment in it. Not everybody has that, but you kind of need that, don't you? You kind of need somebody you or something. You do, you need, a, you need commitment from a firm. And for 50 years, I was mostly with a large firm, although I wasn't with a large, this large firm when I did the first case. But when I started this case, I was. No, I'm not there any longer. I'm with, uh, I'm kind of split. I'm for this case, I'm with one of the uh, two person firm one of my sons has, mm -hmm. but I'm also um, the rest, mostly a staff attorney for the ACLU of Minnesota now, mm. but they, that is not, I don't handle a case out of there. Although okay. they did file an amicus brief in our appeal to the Minnesota Supreme Court. They did, but they weren't in on it from the get go. No. Why not? Or I'd have to ask them. <laughs> well, no, this is, I, I have, I mentioned one son. I've done this, his older brother is, has been my co-counsel um, through this whole thing. The, actually the Minneapolis NAACP was the, was the lead plaintiff in the first case. But um, we have an NAACP here that uh, is not in favor, does not favor desegregation. That in itself is interesting, isn't it? Well, it's yeah, but it's not. We ran into that trouble in the first case. The um, the administration of the in the first case was interesting. We started in 1995. The governor was a Republican, um, Arnie Carlson. The attorney general was a Democrat, Skip Humphrey, Hubert Humphrey the mm. third. Um, Carlson thought. He didn't even want to talk to us. Humphrey might have wanted to talk to us, but he never did. In the middle of the case, Jesse Ventura gets elected governor. Mm. And uh, that Mike I remember. Had, yeah. Yeah. And Jesse says, what are we doing with this case? Settle it. Mm. So that's how we settled it. Now, um, in the middle of the case, one of the things that my son was very, the older one, was very, John, the older one thought was very important was direct action. So he organized busloads of um, parents, of, you know, kids who were in segregated schools and including Native Americans and took them to school board meetings of the Minneapolis school board, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. they disrupted. Sure. And, and uh, the, with the new administration of the um, NAACP, uh, they didn't like what we were doing. And they said, they came to me and they said, you know, you have to control your son. I said, sure, no chance. Um, <laughs> and uh, then they said, well, you know, if you don't, we're going to have to fire you. They, and we said, fine, fire us. So we went out, we got a, uh, a, a group of Hmong parents and filed a second case. Really? Yeah, so he said, okay, fire us. We'll just do this in the second case. So they, of course, they didn't fire us. The two cases were put together and they were ultimately settled. Um, but- But you, you found know, pushback from parents too, not just the NAACP organization, but was there were there parents that didn't want to disrupt their, their neighborhood school that they've grown accustomed to, even if it was deficient? Sure. And also, also there were- there's a huge constituency of adults who live off the basically the education budget. It is a jobs program gotcha. for um, a lot of uh, people who wouldn't otherwise, you know, have that kind of income. And so uh, it's not with them, they, they definitely have an interest and it's not necessarily the same as the kids. But um, we found a lot of opposition there. 
Have you considered in this current mediation layering in, uh, in the very contemporary sense, remote learning? And because of the way this year has gone with COVID and everything, it seems to me that that's been an opportunity that's opened up to yeah, cross but boundaries. It's, but it's shown to be a failure. That's the problem. Mm. It's, you know, it's only widened the gap because of the um, sure. truth of two reasons, the availability of the hardware and the availability of connectivity. Yeah. So, um, you know, we don't rule it out, but it's no substitute for um, integration. You mentioned, uh, and I think it was a, a lecture to a class that your daughter's a principal? Yes, the principal at a middle school, uh, which is, I would say it's one of the less segregated um, schools now in the, in the twins in Minneapolis, although by race, but um, she's still dealing with um, a high percentage of free or reduced lunch. But she's in her um, fourth year at that school and has kind of turned it around. What's helped her turn it around? What what is what is there some strategy? Is she just a, a dynamic uh, leader or? Well, there's both, but they they're I mean, she's a dynamic leader. She loves kids, and she is a genius at relating to kids. Hmm. And that's you know, all the kids in the school know they can talk to her. Um, she is very up on you know developments and new things. They have um, a restorative justice program with another, another organization that I'm on the board of uh, called the Legal Rights Center that does juvenile restorative justice to help keep kids in school and out of the criminal uh, justice pipeline. So it's a, and she's, you know, she's gotten rid of the bad apples in the faculty. Hmm. You know, the, the, the resistance one teacher in particular that, you know, doesn't want, didn't want to be there, doesn't like, didn't like kids. Um, and, and she's also created morale in the staff, buy in from the staff mostly, um, and, the, and the faculty. So, was it, uh, you mentioned that it's less segregated than that used to be. Is that, is that right? Did, did becoming, yes. becoming less segregated, was that beneficial? Of course. Yeah. What's your, what's your vision for these schools in, in Minneapolis and St. Paul say, you know, this change takes time, even if, even, even when right. you get say mediation works and you get the legislation, then what's your vision for what you would, what you'd like to see for, for children in, in that area? Well, we would, the, assuming we have magnets, magnet schools, that um, we would have a network of magnet schools, but more importantly, we would have schools that are, when schools are recognized as isolated by race or socioeconomic status, ad adjacent schools or adjacent districts would have to reserve places for children who fall into what I call tiers four and five of being disadvantaged economically. Um, they would have to reserve a number of places that would integrate the school. Now, whether they fill them or not would be up to the parents hmm. because um, in today, the, you know, forcing parents to transfer their kids um, would create such a public outroar and be so politically unpalatable. Um, especially, you know, now we're trying to unite and heal and come back from the dark night we've been in for four years. Mm -hmm. you know, I tell people it's like, um, I feel like I've just taken off a pair of tight shoes. Yeah, after a long night of walking in them or walking many miles. Yeah. yeah. Did, did, the, uh, did the attention from the George Floyd case uh, help in terms of highlighting some issues that 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 you feel like could need to be addressed and through this means too, like in terms of the politics of it? I definitely think so. I mean, it's it's done that to the same. I mean, this community got a black eye and it was well deserved because we have had one of the largest achievement gaps for years. 
one of the largest wealth gaps in um, things like home ownership forever. Um, and I think people are aware of that um, and they're sensitized much more to um, grievances, just grievances to racism, systemic racism, um, you know, white privilege and all that. Um, you know, the riots that came along with it were, were not helpful. Mm -hmm. um, although I think we now know that there was a lot of outside agitation from, you know, the, basically the right mm -hmm. to create that from people who came into the community to intentionally to, you know, break windows and loot to and ultimately, I think, generate a, a race war. So that didn't help. But on the, but it certainly raised the awareness of people um, that we need to do something. One more area before I let you go. Uh, Dad, I, you got all day. You Beautiful. Because <laughs> the more I think about these issues, the more things I think about, which is good. Uh, housing and schools. You know, it, it, there's a tail wagging the dog, wagging the tail of the dog, chicken egg. Uh, do you think that by doing some better work to integrate the school system, desegregate, that housing might also follow? Yes. Some would say you have to figure out housing to get the schools right, but no, I don't know. It, it's, they are uh, symbiotic, it's interdependent as the, um, and that I, have you talked, Myron Norfield is a person you should talk to. You know Myron? I don't. You may have heard of his brother, Gary. At UCLA. Yes. yes. Myron is a professor at the University of Minnesota Law School. Okay. Uh, Gary's younger brother. Gotcha. Uh, and he has done a lot of work in this, and he's helping us with the lawsuit. And he has found that as schools integrate, housing tends to stabilize. So... Um, we had um, a fellow from Rutgers, Paul Jaworski, I may be saying his name a little bit incorrectly, but he was the one who did the study a few years ago that talked about concentrated poverty across the country. And Syracuse was number one on the list for concentrated poverty for African-American families, and I think second for Hispanic families, and which is essentially that two levels of discrimi discrimination essentially for, or segregation, I should say. You yeah. know, not only is it racial, but it is poverty. And and yeah. I walked some neighborhoods with him in our community and and none of it was surprising. You know, he was a data guy, but then yeah. seeing it in person, the boarded up houses, the old housing stock, um, you know, children growing up in that environment and only knowing that environment um, yeah. and how limiting that is. Um, and we and he and I were batting back and forth that notion of, well, you know, do you fix the housing? Do you fix the schools? Do they, do they need to go at the same, you know, be parallel to each other? Um, what's easier? <laughs> None of it's easy. Right. Well, you know, one of the things that's happening here uh, is that um, African-American families have been leaving the cities and going to the suburbs. So the mm -hmm. entering suburbs are integrating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And mostly they have very progressive superintendents who are, in effect, fostering integration. That happened in Eden Prairie. Mm -hmm. They had a superintendent who redrew boundaries. And um, I happened, I was retained a representer uh, because there was such a public outcry. And now they, what she caused her to resign ultimately. Interesting. Um, but she's still in the area. Um, but now they think what she did was wonderful. They wouldn't change it at all. Yeah. And it, but that first bite of the apple is a tough one to take. I'm oh, sure. yeah. I, I went to uh, education, um, Board of Education meetings that were, it got really ugly. And they elected a whole new board because of this. Um, but I mean, you'd be amazed at, you know, the ugliness um, that surfaced over all this. But what she did was the right thing. And uh, there are some very good 
um, suburban superintendents that are that are redrawing boundaries, um, you know, attendance areas. Interesting. Maintain integration. And, and we have a, you know, we're we're a smaller community, but we do have we do have, for example, we have one school district that's very good that is just outside the city limits that gets ranked nationally for the biggest gap between a district next to a city district, which yeah. has very poor performance. So you have, you know, immediate inner sub inner ring suburb school district doing very well, right next to sure. part of the city school district that's doing very poorly and say, whatever, 30-40% achievement gap between them, yeah. you know, I mean, significant. Um, where you if you lived one mile the other direction, your child would have a different experience. Do you think that um, that people have an understanding of the fundamental process of, of redlining and so on that in the in the programs over the course of a century essentially, or close to it at this point, led to the setup of our cities and suburbs as they exist today? Do do people understand that? That you I find? would say generally no. Yeah, I don't think that's common knowledge. I don't. I don't either. And and I, that's actually what. Uh, in fact, uh, while we're talking, I'm going to put this map up here for you. This was the map of Syracuse. If you do, you see it on your screen. Yeah. This old map, um, which got me extra interested in this topic this past summer. And that's the wide shot of it. So that's this whole city of Syracuse. This is from 19. 19. Mm. And what I found this in the National Archives um, when I was browsing through Syracuse related items. And this is what was really, I thought, shocking is the, the overt handwritten labels of neighborhoods where people oh, live. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You so know, you see I'm... Jewish, Negro, Italian, Polish, Irish, you know, the newer at the time, either 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 newer European immigrants or or in the right. case of the great migration from the south, the, the the small Negro neighborhood, which then grew, but you notice the color of the lines. Yeah, right. You know, isn't that, isn't that something? I was on. We, we were on a call last night with some friends. Um, he was, he's African American. When they put uh, the interstate highway through. Um, <laughs> the Twin Cities. Sure, they wiped out uh, the African American neighborhood in St. Paul, uh, Rondo, and then he had my friend Marvin um, Anderson. He had a map from the 1930s, and on the map there was written uh, Negro, Jewish, Italian neighborhood. Well, it's funny. Those you should, very words. That it's it, it's funny you should say that because uh, you see where. This, this is obviously pre-highway, um, and right through where it says Jewish, the letter H, that's where Route 81, the interstate, cut right through Syracuse, which turned into, by the 1950s, mostly the Black neighborhood. Yeah. And they did exactly the same thing. That whole 15th yeah. ward in the center of our map took out what was primarily at that point a Black neighborhood and a, and a, and a fairly vibrant one where the, the two schools there were um, were almost 100% African-American, not by de jure segregation, as they yeah. referred to it, but by neighborhood. And and the, the, your friend's story is exactly the same. That And, and now we're in the midst of deciding uh, to tear down that highway. And part of the conversation is uh, the social justice element to it, essentially, you know, of you know, our, and, and our mayor of Syracuse, whose grandfather actually was the mayor when the highway went through in the 60s, he is saying, well, well, we'll have to rebuild those neighborhoods, which quite honestly is, I'm not sure it's necessary to say you're going to rebuild them because it's 70 years ago by the time the new, yeah. you know, the new solution is arrived at. But, well, but you're, you're, you're talking about the exact same story in a different city. That's remarkable. Yeah, right. No, they're putting in a park and a, a plaza and a bridge here. Um, yeah, to commemorate the it was, the neighborhood was called Rondo to commemorate it. Yeah, this was the the fifteenth ward is what it was called. And and while while I'm looking at uh, so then that was the 1919 map. And then you you're you're well aware of the I'm going to do this. Uh, I got to do a new share for you to see the other one here. I guess. Um, do you see a different map now? 
Yeah. This is the map from 1934, where you now you see the red lines have been extended and, and the African-American neighborhood had grown. So that's still the center of the map. You see 15 yeah. there, 15th Ward. But now these, this is literally a red-lined map, um, which was part of the homeowner loan corporation maps and the FHA programs, which led to the discriminatory lending practices that existed for the next 40 or 50 years. Yeah. You know, um, my son John's wife is a graduate of Syracuse. You know, oh, is that right? Yeah. We Where's have a very good friend who was taught there, who lives in the kind of in the country nearby, Marilyn Higgins. I don't know if you Oh, know. I do. I know Marilyn Higgins. She lives, you know she, lives in Can she lives in Canastota. Yeah. Um, which is like a throughway exit too. But um, yes, yeah, she She's been around a long time and we were on a board together at the Morrisville College for a short time. She's uh, a wonderful person. She is. Now she's she's a friend of yours? Yeah, we met her because, um, well, she was here running a program for the University of Minnesota. Turns out her daughter um, was involved with a restorative justice program in Toronto. Um, and uh, we met her daughter through our restorative justice work. And she said, oh, my mother's in Minneapolis. So we contacted her, oh boy, maybe two years ago. Yeah. And we became very good friends and she, we stay in touch with Marilyn. Yeah, she's a pretty dynamic person. And I, yeah, and I recall her being out of town for a while. She was working on um, some stuff for Syracuse University when they were redeveloping actually the, an area on this west near west side of this of this same map obviously yeah. this is yeah. years ago but um she spent like a year or two in minnesota yeah i recall her her leaving town and and we're still in touch on facebook the beauty of social media these days you know can you just give me a second because i just got the draft joint statement oh yeah on the page i just need to look at it sure <clears throat> I'm going to actually end our recording. I'm going to keep the call up, but I'm just going to end the recording okay. to make sure that's working fine.